A very good afternoon to you. This is NTV at one. Thanks very much for joining us. I'm Smriti Vidyarthi. Now, shortly this afternoon, President Uhuru Kenyatta is set to give the State of the Nation address. And there are plenty of expectations, considering this address is coming amidst a pandemic. We've got all angles covered for you from across the country. And we kick off with NTV's senior political affairs reporter, Kennedy Murethi, at Parliament. Also on your screen is Bridget Ngana. She will join us live from the county of Nakuru. Let's take you to Parliament, where the um, address is set to take place from. Kennedy, no doubt Parliament is abuzz with activity. What are some of the murmurs you're hearing from MPs. And right, Smithy, it has been a buzz with activity, as you have said, and for the last one hour there has been heightened activity. And actually we've seen some of the army bosses who've just come in, and that is a clear signal that any time from 2 o'clock President Uhuru Kenyatta will be expected to arrive at this particular point as they, as he now readies to give his State of the Nation address. But as you've also said, is that there is a myriad of information of what Kenyans are expecting from President Uhuru Kenyatta, from how will he address job losses, how will he tackle BBI, because it is one of the talking points in the country right now, on the state of the security of the country and all this. And we do expect also President Uhuru Kenyatta will be announcing some recovery measures with regards to COVID-19. Remember, the country has just been hit with a second wave of the coronavirus, and many believe that if things were to be shut at this particular time, then the country will never recover from what it has. But right now, I'm joined by Chris Wamalwa, Member of Parliament, just to tell us what are some of the expectations that you expect from today's uh, speech from, of President Uhuru Kenyatta with regards to all these issues and what, are, what would you really want to see in that particular speech? First of all, I want to say that uh, it is uh, an obligation of the president in line with Article 132 of the Constitution that he has to have a special sitting in Parliament today and to address three fundamental issues, as you've clearly put it, one on matters of uh, security of the nation and two, the international obligation. You know, Kenya is not existing in isolation and Kenya is part and parcel of many of uh, international treaties, treaties which yes. have been ratified by parliament. So he needs to explain to the Kenyans to what extent has he realized those international obligations. And thirdly, he's supposed to address the nation pertaining on matters of uh, governance in line with Article 10 of the Constitution. And this is where he's going to look at the issues of integrity, issues of devolution, issues of governance. We are aware about the BBI issue as we speak right now, because every Kenya is talking about BBI. And at the content of the Constitution, it clearly talks about issues of public participation. And this BBI report, some have been saying that there's no room for improvement. And uh, the back stops are the president, because the president has said it clearly, that let the people read. And when you have any issue, we want these issues to put everybody on board. So today is the day that Kenyans are expecting so much from the president. Looking at the challenges we have, the coronavirus uh, challenges that we have right now, as you know, schools are at home. Uh, the positivity rate is very high, and yet the schools have not been closed. The issues of corruption, are we done with the corruption? The other day we had, uh, we, have, we had told you have COVID uh, billionaires. The Kemsa matter has not yet been resolved. So we expect a lot from the president, and particularly governance, because this is his second last uh, address to, to parliament. And, and also Mwishimiwa staying on that matter of corruption. We saw also President Uhuru Kenyatta just the other day receive a report from the from the DPP and this report is with regards to the cases that are going that are taking place but then again you hear governors in Naivasha say that they want to be absolved from criminal culpability if their name is not on the signature what would you say about that remember in parliament sometimes back there was a law which had been proposed on the floor of the house that government go governors should enjoy some immunity when they're still in office and you, we oppose that so governors cannot take us a transom. We are opposed to that. And any Kenyan who is going to misappropriate, any governor who is going to misappropriate the public funds must be, if he's culpable, the law, of the, the law must take its course. So that issue alone 
we are not going to accept because a lot of resources have been devolved. We are seeing a lot of corruption. When you come to my county in Transvaal County, all the billions the governor cannot explain. The projects he started, he has never launched any. No, no, no. Moshimia will not give you an opportunity because he's not <laughs> here to actually defend himself. But the point is home that we cannot absolve them from criminal no, we culpability. No, we cannot. And this is, these are just some of the issues that we do expect are going to crop up from President Uhuru Kenyatta's speech today. As everybody is really waiting to see the issue that Mushimiwa has actually alluded to, the question of COVID billionaires. Remember, the president had addressed himself to the question of uh, within 21 days they would want uh, that matter dealt with. But we've seen that the DPP received that file and returned it saying that there was no sufficient evidence. So how is he going to do this and what do we expect, noting that President Uhuru Kenyatta has actually received a list. Uh, Mushimiwa will also remember that uh, some time back, President Uhuru Kenyatta had come with a list of people who are supposed to be, have been prosecuted here. Do we also see such a scenario, noting that the DPP has actually given him another report just a few it days ago? It is very, very unfortunate to find that uh, that was just a preliminary list where the investigations had not been completed. So if at all the president is coming with the end list, he must ensure that uh, the due process has been followed, full investigation has been done, because that was just a preliminary. And uh, at that time, ESEC made a, a lot of mistakes. So if at all the president is coming with any list, which we'll celebrate, let it be the list that has gone through the due process in terms of, uh, in terms of investigation, and there's full evidence that the matter can be taken to court and hold the, the matter on the, on the side. Thank you very Thank much, you. Mweshimema. And these are some of the comments that we are receiving and will be receiving as the day goes by, as most members of parliament now and the whole Kenyans expect to hear from President Uhuru Kenyatta, who is going to be addressing the country probably from about three o'clock, and he'll be addressing himself to most of these issues. And a point has come up that they will not want to hear from the president if he has some inconclusive answers. There has been speculation about this particular report that was given to President Uhuru Kenyatta at the beginning of this week, where we have heard that about seven cabinet ministers and also principal secretaries are in that list that was given to President Uhuru Kenyatta. Will he be prescribing something? Will he be speaking to the COVID billionaires that was done by Dennis Okari? And also, what measures will be be looking at in combating COVID-19? We have also been told that it is now spreading very fast in counties. And President Uhuru Kenyatta was able to give uh, county governments that opportunity to now look at this particular matter and prescribe measures according to the severity of this particular disease in their own counties. So we are keeping an eye just to know what is it that President Uhuru Kenyatta will be addressing the nation to coming just a week after he gave some new measures on combating coronavirus that will mean that your Christmas and your new year will be spent in-house. Back to you, Smriti, in studio. All right, Kennedy, thanks very much indeed. That was NTV Senior Political Affairs reporter Kennedy Moreri coming to us live from Parliament. The location of where President Uhuru Kenyatta is set to give his State of the Nation address later this afternoon. Kennedy, more from you as the afternoon progresses. For now, though, let's take you live to the coastal county of Mombasa. And there we have uh, NTV's Kevin Mutai with the latest uh, from that region. Kevin, what can you share with us? All right, apologies for that. Uh, we will try get hold of Kevin Mutai uh, later on in this uh, broadcast. All right, now, uh, earlier we saw NTV's uh, Bridget Ngana at the top of the hour. She is in Nakuru County where bishops have been speaking. Uh, plenty has come up from that discussion, which was linked to the State of the Nation address. Uh, Bridget, it's good to see you. What can you tell us? Well, Smriti, we are at the National Marian Shrine in Subuki, and this is a very significant place for the Catholic Church because every year this is where all the Catholic faithful congregate to pray for the country. And today the Conference of Catholic Bishops, 22 of them in number, have issued a State of the Nation review, and they have 
specifically focused on the BBI report with raising concerns rather in the report there in the end. I would rather say right now it's like it, there is a sense that the Catholic Church is somewhat opposed to the proposals or some of, of the proposals in the BBI report because according to the bishops they say number one, the issue of an expanded executive. They say that this creates a sense of an imperial presidency and their fears that this defeats the logic behind um, behind uh, fair elections rather and the winner takes all because it creates an imperial president who has the powers to appoint the deputy prime ministers. They fear this is against the spirit of us having a democratic state. Another thing the bishops have raised is the issue of an expanded parliament. They feel that currently the Kenyan people are under a burdened high wage bill in all the representations. They say the members of parliament at both the National Assembly and the Senate are too much and this country is dealing with a, with a huge wage bill at a time when the economy has been drastically affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. They also raise concerns with the issue of the independence of the police, the creation of a police council. They say this will transform the country into a police state and at the same time they feel it is not in the right direction for this country. Again, the bishops are calling for dialogue. They say that this is not a document cast in stone. I'll just take you back to some time last week when I was in Naivasha where the president and the right honorable Raila Odinga did speak with the members of parliament from the Senate and National Assembly and the feeling there was that this document is good and the country should accept it as it is and then there would be room for proposals later on and these are sentiments even by the National Assembly Majority Leader Amos Kimunya but today the bishops are saying let us take a step back, let us dialogue, let the views that are arising that are divergent to what is in the BBI report be heard and recommended. They say it is not a document cast in stone, it is a draft in progress and it is something that can be amended the president is a Catholic and he has a lot of liking to this shrine, a lot of significance to this place. And we do believe maybe when the Catholic Church speaks, the president will take an ear to what they are saying. Over and above all, the bishops are asking for every Kenyan to read through this report, to have a sense of what it really means, because they are talking about this document is already reflecting or representative of the proposals in the constitution, and it should be progressive, move the constitution forward, and not um, seem to be something that would rather take us back into the days of uh, imperialism or dictatorship or authoritarianism. And so the bishops are really, really vocal, and they are hoping that they will be heard, and this is something they are expecting also political leaders to really come in and listen to one another, have that spirit of handshake because they say they have been observing from a distance but right now they're really concerned with the feeling that this BBI report is eliciting with the Mwananchi, the sense that it is creating yes and no camps, those for or against it and they feel that it is not proper for the country because they feel as the shepherds of the country they do believe that this country should be looked at from a posterity measure and so BBI should be for the posterity of Kenya and not about 2022 politics. They've also called upon um, the leaders to also help the people to synthesize this document and also kind of help people to understand it in a better way and not um, the current situation where it is about positions of power for a select few and defeats the logic of helping the Monanchi progress and go forward in this report. All right, a lot of details from that meeting. Bridget, thanks very much. Uh, interviews Bridget Ngana coming to us live from Nakuru County as uh, the Kenya Conference of Catholic Bishops uh, have completed their meeting. All right, now we can take you back to Mombasa where we've got NTV's Kevin Mutai. Kevin, what do you have for us from the coastal county of Mombasa ahead of the State of the Nation address? Well, of course, uh, Smriti, that is definitely what the residents of Mombasa are expecting the president to do today when he'll be appearing uh, uh, in the National Assembly addressing the bicameral parliament that is uh, members of the National Assembly together with the Senate. And of course, uh, a lot of Kenyans are expecting to have uh, to hear what the president uh, will have to say with regards to what his administration has achieved since uh, he was re-elected back into office 
in 2017, but uh, coming at a time uh, when the president will be addressing the nation under a very uh, difficult environment. This is uh, because of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, which has ravaged the economy. But of course, uh, Kenyans are expecting to hear the president outlining the strategies and what his administration is planning going forward to ensure that the country will be able to bounce back uh, to its uh, position and of course uh, what he's uh, willing, I mean, uh, intending to do to uh, address this issue of COVID-19 pandemic. Remember that also uh, schools have had a very huge impact uh, with regards to this particular pandemic. Here in Mombasa alone, uh, three schools have been closed with even cases of uh, students and teachers getting infected with the virus. But of course also another key concern is how uh, the president will address the issue of the economy. Uh, remember that this has also suffered a big blow. But uh, if you allow me, Smith, let me just quickly get uh, one of the views from a uh, local here to just uh, quickly tell us what uh, are you expecting to hear from the president this afternoon? Yeah, Kamajina, naituwa Mboya Tomo Gana, kutoka Mjiwa Mombasa. Mimi kama mkaji mama Mombasa ningependa kwanza kabisa rais aongee kuhusu COVID-19 kwa sababu inasemekana ya kwamba inaongezeka kwa haraka sana mpaka tajusi hospitali yetu jamaa ika, itafunguliwa kwa sababu ya corona na tena kitu ambacho nataka kusikia kuhusu rais akisema katika hotuba yake ni kwamba tuko na watoto shuleni haswa wa msingi wa shule wa msingi haswa wa darasa la nne naomba vile vile ugonjwa imeenea naomba kama wanaweza kutoa watoto wa darasa la nne shuleni manake hamakika ugonjwa huu kwa kisema ni mbaya na tena inaenea kwa kazi mimi nashangaa mtoto wa darasa la nne atafanyaje ikiwa ni hivyo basi katika utuba wake mimi naomba kabisa onge tu kwa kuhusu corona. Asante haraka kabisa. Bora kisha tutamlisha kwa majina wetu nani alafu tueleze watarajia kusikia nini kutoka kwa hotuba yake Rais Kenyatta. Kwa majina nafahamika. Naomba uvalie maski yako vizuri tafadhali. Kwa majina nafahamika kama kilio na hilo mimi ni mkaji wa hapa Mombasa. Lakini kwa ili jambo la leo ambalo rais atakaloongea ningelipenda sana sana kwa upande wa polisi walegeze kamba kwa wananchi. Hii mambo ya mask isiwe ati njia ya kutafuta miela. Angalau wawe na zile za kusaidia wale wajiwezi. Akikupata una waweze kukupatia ah tumia hii kwa vile una una uwezo ya kununua mask. Lakini ikiwa ati ukipatikana bila mask papele kwa ndani, watiliwa ndani, hataswa pesa nyingi ambazo hatujui zinaenda mahali gani. Alafu cha pili kuna zile maeneo ambazo zinakaa ambao watu wajiwezi kabisa. Unapata county government pamoja na polisi wanazunguka maeneo kama hayo na badala wapeane hizo mask wanashika tu wananchi. Sawa. Uh, well of course uh, Smriti earlier on when we interviewed uh, some uh, residents from uh, Nyali constituency some of the, some of them uh, raised some very uh, ish, key issues that they feel that they need to uh, hear from the president and one of them is the issue of graft uh, asking the president to outline key uh, I mean, uh, areas that perhaps he will be focusing on to be able to eradicate corruption in the country. The other issue is the Building Bridges Initiative uh, with residents expecting the president to give them a way forward on that particular issue. But of course, this is something that a lot of residents are really willing uh, to talk about and will be here on standby uh, to come back with more details uh, with regards to the state of the uh, nation address today, today in Parliament. All right, Kevin, thank you so much for that. More from you later on this afternoon. NTV's Kevin Mutai coming to us live from Mombasa. Now, as Kenyans prepare to hear President Uhuru Kenyatta's report on the state of the nation, NTV will also be reporting on the state of West Pokot County. We're back on the road, and all roads this weekend lead to West Pokot County for the Discovery Edition. Our team will show us why West Pokot holds a special place in our political history, sample the cultural offerings, and capture the developments in the northern frontier. Not forgetting efforts at peace building as well, something that is coming out as a big issue ahead of the President's State of the uh, Nation address. All right, let's uh, take you now to our team. Uh, Olive Burrows joins us. Olive, where 
where exactly are you on your journey to reach West Pokot? Well, it's me to you, vroom, vroom. We were so looking forward to what you just had to tell us there as you sat on that motorcycle, uh, Olive. Uh, apologies for that. We will uh, hopefully get Olive back uh, on air with us. For now, let's take you to Kisumu County where we can join NTV's Oko Okusa. Uh, hi, Okusa. What are some of the residents in the all-important county of Kisumu saying ahead of this afternoon's address? Well, of course, as expected, they have a lot of expectations regarding this particular address by the president. And uh, earlier on, when we spoke with uh, a number of them, they were advancing a couple of uh, issues that they would like the president to tackle during his address. One of them being the BBI debate or, or report, and of course, another one being the COVID-19 uh, measures that are being uh, enforced here in Kisumu, which uh, some residents feel that uh, the authorities are a bit hard on them. And let's just hear from uh, uh, one of them here. Ebuanza na jina yako alafu tueleze tu mataraji yako kuhusu hutuba ya rais leo. Kwa majina naitwa Ambrose kijana wa nguvu kutoka Kisumu City. Maoni yangu ya kwanza nilikuwa naonelea mambo ya BBI. Bwana Mheshimiwa kiongea alete alete wananchi kama sisi watu wa chini. Tu, tuone tusome tuojue nini ambayo iko ndani ndio sasa tupitishe. Atuwezi pitisha kitu ya tujai soma. Lazima tusome kwanza, tusingatie. Ni nini ambayo ikondani. Atuweza pitisha kitu ya indatufunga. Lazima tusome, tujue mikakati gani imejipanga hapo ndani. Ni ayo tu. Ngine, tenauna wa maoni ngine, matarajio. Matarajio, yenye raithi ya kisumia ni mamba ya COVID-19. Mamba ya COVID-19, wana mweshimiwa kikuja kwa kutuba, atupatie tafadhali allowance ile ya ya kafiu unajua ile sema saa 4 kama watu wa sekta yetu ya chini nataka tupatie saa 4 nusu ili tujipange kuko na wenzetu wenye wanachukuanga ile kitu yetu inaitwa pombe Wana, wanafunga saa tatu. na hiyo harakati ya kuchukua saa tatu, inabidi tu, tuangoje tuwapeleke wengine wanaishi mbali lazima tuwafikishe tu, makwao ndio pia sisi tuku tuende kwa manyumba sasa ndio nilikuwa nataka atupatie allowance at least ikuwe saa hii nusu asante all right all right i don't know whether we have any body house unaweza changia kidogo dakika moja tu yes sasa na jina lafu tueleze ni matarajio gani unayo kuhusu hotuba ya rais leo ni pengine maswala gani ungependa agusie kwanza kabisa majina yangu naitwa Bradley Wanjala Mechumo majina yangu naitwa Bradley Wanjala Mechumo matarajio yangu kwa hotuba ya rais leo ni aguzie hasa hii corona sisi imeharibu biashara sasa mimi natarajia kwamba hii mambo ya biashara aongelee atengeneza maneno at least pia sisi yani tu, tuinuke kibiashara jambo la pili inahusu hii mambo ya kafio hii mambo ya kafio Hey, wengine naona kama asongeje atoe tu maneno atoe maneno kwa sababu inaharibu biashara asante well smithy those are some of uh, the views of uh, kisumu residents here and uh, they are varied the people who are talking uh, that who like the president to address the curfew issues uh, they are saying that uh, the hours should be a bit ex i mean extended so that it doesn't affect their businesses as such uh, and of course uh, another person there has spoken about the BBI asking uh, the president to and uh, just uh, find a way of uh, making sure that the report uh, is made available to residents uh, to go through it before they participate in anything that touches on BBI. So those are their reasons and of course uh, we'll be keeping our ears on the ground here until the president addresses the nation and maybe get their reactions if uh, the, 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 the expectations have been met by the president's speech. Back to you Smriti. Right. Oh, Kusa, thank you. And uh, sure, we will be coming back to you uh, to get the reactions once the president has uh, spoken. NTV's Oko Okusa coming to us live from Kisumu County. Let's uh, take you back to uh, Olive Burrows, who's on her way to West Pokot. Olive, uh, you're on a motorbike. Um, what are you doing there and what more can you tell us?
Apologies for that. It seems that uh, the, the connection with Olive on her way to West Pocot is uh, rather faulty. We will try and get her back as we really do need to find out what she has to tell us sitting on that motorbike. You are watching NTV at 1 as we get closer to the President's State of the Nation address that will come to us live from Parliament uh, soon this afternoon. We'll have all angles covered for you. At this point, though, we've got to take a quick break break during this broadcast, but more when we return. Stay with us. The wait is over. Check out Jumia Black Fridays for unbeatable deals all month. Shop the biggest sale of the year with up to 80% off. Your Black Fridays, even crazier with DTB. Sona moja imetengenezo kwenjia speciali ili kupambana na maumivu kwa haraka. Sona moja ina aspirin kama kiungo. Sona moja, kitulizo kamili. Maumivu ya kizidi, pata ushauri wa daktari. New Blue Band Mayonnaise. Made from natural ingredients with omega-3 and 6, to enjoy long-lasting freshness and natural taste unlike any other mayo. Grow healthy and happy kids with new Blue Band Mayonnaise. Oh my, oh my, oh my days. Life is wonderful. for unbeatable deals all month. Shop the biggest sale of the year with up to 80% off. Jumia Black Fridays, even crazier with DTB. Thanks for staying with us on NTV at 1. I'm Smriti Vidyarthi. And do stay tuned as later on this afternoon we will be broadcasting live from Parliament where President Uhuru Kenyatta is set to give his State of the Nation address. It is the eighth one for President Kenyatta and certainly comes at a difficult time for the President and the nation at large. On your screen right now, live pictures from Parliament. As you can see, the band there uh, ready to... Uh, uh, perform and march. There we go. And NTV's Kennedy Morevi is live at that location. He'll be bringing us everything we need to know. Uh, various MPs have already spoken to Kennedy, sharing their views on what they expect. Remember, the country right now is dogged with a number of issues. First and foremost, the COVID-19 pandemic, which has hugely affected the nation's healthcare systems and healthcare workers too. Remember, just this week uh, we reported a large number of healthcare workers have been affected by the virus and a number of them have died from it while fighting on the front lines. In addition to that, the COVID-19 pandemic has hit the economy in ways we couldn't even imagine. We'll be delving deeper into some of these issues. Also expected um, are issues surrounding schools and education. At the moment, thousands, if not more, of uh, pupils are currently out of school and of course issues of corruption and national unity are expected to be raised in that state of the nation address coming later this afternoon for now let's just listen in as the band marches on wearing their face masks
Maliza. Maringa, una maliza. All right, but uh, anyway, we will uh, take you back to Parliament uh, this afternoon ahead of the address. Uh, for now, though, let's uh, shift focus for a little bit and bring you other stories making headlines today. And uh, we start off with the story about a middle-aged man that has been arraigned at the Cabernet High Court after being found in possession of elephant tusks along the Ainamoy Barwesa Road. The Kenya Wildlife Service officers arrested the suspect, that's Matthew Kiptis Nyomboy, who with uh, three kilos of tusks with a street value of 300,000 shillings. Appearing before senior principal magistrate Paul Biwat, the suspect was charged with illegal possession of ivory and handling the ivory without a license. The court issued him with a bond of 300,000 shillings and a surety of the same amount. The case will be heard on the 9th of December. Residents of Tabaka and Nyachenge in Kisi County are raising concerns over mistreatment from enforcement officers. They have accused police officers from the area of turning the wearing of face masks order into a cash cow. According to the residents, the officers are taking money from the rule breakers as opposed to taking them to court. The residents are also saying that the enforcement officers are overstepping their mandate by arresting people from their homes. They're now urging the Inspector General of Police to rein in rogue police officers. <laughs> They leave that person alone. station, wanamchukua anasema hana mask sasa ukiwa shambani lazima uvae mask mind ndio unapea corona ama ni mtu unapea corona all right, police in Molo have arrested two suspects who were found with 179 litres of ethanol in a casino in Molo town. The ethanol was found packed in 20 litre, litre bottles with others hidden in small packages of the outlawed polythene papers. Uh, the ethanol, estimated to be worth 400,000 shillings, was confiscated by the DCI officers from Molo town following a tip-off from the public. The arrests come days after a 52-year-old man was found dead after being sodomized as he walked home from drinking. Angry residents torched five Chang'a dens in Muchorwe, Molo sub-county, to protest his death. The immediate former chairman of Nakada, John Mutudo, has called on the residents to give information to the police to help fight the illicit brew, which is rampant in the area.
ile kitendo ya kuchukua mzee wa miaka hamsini unamfunga na soksi ya wanawake kwa mdomo unafunga unafunga mkono unafunga mkono mzee na ana maneno alafu unamfanyia hiyo madhambi ambayo hata hata shetani mwenyewe rusi hawezi kukubali alafu wewe askari unaenda kulinda huyo huyo mtu ambaye alichuhudia hizo kitu wewe umelaaniwa hata kwa shetani utakataliwa kwa sababu makosa yako ni mengi kushinda shetani wewe mwenyewe I want to encourage members of public to assist the police with the information so that we arrest all those peddlers in this illicit drink. I want also to send a clear uh, warning to those who are involved in the, this kind of uh, business that I think they are being very unfair, very hurtly. It is heartless for members of public to lose lives because of this uh, ethanol and uh, we hope that uh, we are going to have a breakthrough elsewhere the national hospital insurance fund that's the nhif now says it will need additional funds appropriated by the national treasury if it is to provide cover for kenyans suffering from covid 19. the national insurer has echoed the sentiments of private insurance companies who say it's not viable for them to fully cover COVID-19 patients' care in health facilities due to the high costs, which, according to them, may render some of them bankrupt. Senators who attended a virtual meeting with insurance companies, the NHIF, the Association of Kenya Insurers, and the Insurance Regulatory Authority, have asked the industry players to come up with a plan to cushion patients hospitalized for COVID-19, even as they state that they are already working with 24 second-tier hospitals to provide cover for clients to the tune of slightly above 350,000 shillings. The epidemics and the pandemics are extremely catastrophic. And therefore, the claims in terms of numbers and in claims of the, the amount, in terms of the amounts, are so huge that no insurer would be able to meet those kind of claims. The authority has also remained vigilant in monitoring the financial soundness and operational resilience of insurers in support and protection of policyholders in the and maintenance of financial stability. The authority has also pursued a range of regulatory and supervisory measures to provide operational relief to insurers in the wake of COVID-19 and to provide appropriate flexibility to help insurance maintain their safety and soundness and deliver essential services they provide to policyholders and the economy. Based on the current NHIF reimbursement costs for general care and reported market costs for critical care, costs excluding provisions for personal protective equipment, the fund would have been met with an estimated treatment cost of 1.17 billion to 5.44 billion for the treatment of COVID among insured beneficiaries. In scenario two, based on treatment costs inclusive of personal protective equipment. And as published on a Kenry Welcome Trust policy brief, the fund would have incurred a bill of 4.82 billion to 22.51 billion amongst the NHIF insured beneficiaries in the best and worst case scenarios, respectively. And honorable chair and members, it would be good to note that like at 22.5 billion, that represents more than uh, uh, 35% roughly of our total uh, 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 collections annually. All right, KCB Group's net earnings stood at 10.9 billion shillings in the period ended September 2020, a 43% plunge from the same period in 2019. In the period under review, the group took a significant hit from the COVID-19 pandemic, with its pile of non-performing loans surging from 42.6 billion shillings up to 97 billion shillings, surging by an unprecedented 120 28%.
as a result of the deterioration of the asset quality. The group is aggressively creating a buffer with the loan loss provision, closing September 2020 at 20 billion shillings up from just 5.8 billion shillings in the same period in 2019. The bank is inching closer towards a trillion shillings in We've asset base, with its total assets now valued at 972 billion shillings. Uh, and that's uh, primarily because of two, two main reasons. One, uh, you do recall that uh, the regulator uh, waived fees for transactions uh, below a thousand shillings. Uh, so, you know, that's, that, that has had a massive impact on, on, on our performance on service and commissions. And secondly, uh, the uh, FX income line uh, with, the, with the lockdowns globally, uh, the activity, economic activity was subdued. And Equity Group has reported 14.8 billion shillings in net earnings for the period ended September 2020. That's a 14.4% decline compared to the same period uh, last year. Now, the bank's pile of bad debt closed the third quarter of the year at 51.8 billion shillings, having risen from 30.5 billion shillings in 2019. This points to the impact the adverse business environment is having on the group's business. Equity Group's interest income in the period under review grew by 7 billion shillings, closing the period under review at 39.3 billion shillings. All right, in other news now, the Trump administration has carried out sweeping changes atop the Defense Department's civilian leadership structure, removing several of its most senior officials and replacing them with perceived loyalists to the president. The flurry of changes announced by the Department of Defense in a statement roughly 24 hours after President Trump fired Defense Secretary Mark Esper have put officials inside the Pentagon on edge and fueled a growing sense of alarm among military and civilian officials who are concerned about what could come next. Four senior civilian officials have been fired or have resigned since Monday, including Esper, his chief of staff and the top officials of overseeing policy and intelligence. A senior defense official has told U.S. media that, and I quote, it appears we are done with the beheadings for now, end quote, referring to the wave of ousted civilian leaders, including Esper. But the moves will likely only add to the sense of chaos within the Pentagon following Trump's firing of Esper. The president jettisoned him two days after his Democratic opponent, Joe Biden, was projected as the winner of the presidential election, a conclusion that Trump has refused to accept. Concerns are growing that a chaotic transition period could undermine national security. Among those who assumed new roles at the Department of Defense was controversial retired Brigadier General Anthony Tata, who moved into the Pentagon's top policy role, taking over the duties of James Anderson, who resigned Tuesday, according to another U.S. defense official. At the same time, President Trump named Michael Ellis as a general counsel at the National Security Agency over the objections of the Director General Paul Nakasong, Keisha Patel, Anthony Tata, and Ezra Cohen Watnick, three aides whose promotions were announced in a Pentagon statement on Tuesday, are viewed as highly ideological Trump foot soldiers. The three are not believed to have the stature to bully General Mark Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, or General Kenneth McKenzie, the head of the military central command into initiating operations, whether overt or secret, against Iran or other adversaries during the final days of Trump's presidency. Multiple civilian and military officials working inside the Pentagon are raising the question of whether the departure of Esper and other officials will now clear the way for Trump in his final weeks in office to potentially again call for initiatives he wants to pursue that the Pentagon opposes. Another potential raised by officials is he would override the military advice he has been given and bring troops home from Afghanistan by Christmas. U.S. military officials have long stressed that the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan is conditions-based, 
with those conditions including the Taliban's breaking its ties to al-Qaeda and making progress in peace talks with the Afghan government, two conditions that are yet to be met. But despite the lack of progress, the Trump administration has already substantially reduced U.S. troops in Afghanistan to about 4,500, the lowest level since the earliest days of the post-9-11 campaign. Reason. All right, we haven't managed to get Olive Burrows back on air with us, but here is a snippet of what you can expect from the NTV on the Road team as Kenyans prepare to hear President Uhuru Kenyatta's report on the state of the nation. NTV will also be reporting on the state of West Pokot County. Well, we are back on the road, and this weekend, all roads lead to West Pokot County for the Discovery Edition. Our team will show us why West Pokot holds a special place in our political history, sampled the cultural offerings and captured the developments in the northern frontier county, not forgetting efforts at a peace building. Join us on NTV On The Road. Here's a sneak peek. You see what you was forgotten in meticulous. County number 24. NDF, Kabenguria, West Bogot. Rich in cultural heritage, home of beautiful scenes and beautiful people. Turning new chapters in education. Kilimo ndiyo msingi wa uchumi wa kaunti hii. In the sometimes volatile lands, the pursuit of peace continues. West Bokoni nchi ambayo tunapenda amani. NTV on the road, Discovery Edition. Discovery Edition, NTV on the road kicks off tomorrow. Do be sure to tune in and it goes on throughout the weekend. You don't want to miss it. All right, at this point, it's time to shift focus and Watson Karuma has the day's sports news. Watson. That's right. Thank you very much, Smithy. And we start off from the Harambe Stars camp. They're back in training, by the way. And uh, the coach says the lack of fitness could have played a role in Kenya's 1-1 draw against Comoros at the Kasrani Stadium on Wednesday. Kenya had to wait until the 65th minute to find an equalizer, thanks to Masud Juma after the visitors had scored in the first half. According to coach Jacob Ule, without the uh, local leagues, home-based players have been inactive, explaining why only uh, Karyubangi Sharks defender Samuel Oluande started the match alongside foreign-based players. The team needs to pick themselves up as they travel to Comoros for the return tie set for Sunday. The deputy president, who was among the guests at Kasarani, pledged continued support even as he gave the team one billion shillings. <laughs> nafikiri tumecheza kulingana na vile tulikuwa tumetarajia uh, lakini nafikiri tumekosa nafasi nyingi katika mechi haswa kipindi cha pili na Komoro kama vile nilikuwa nimesema hapo awali ni timu ambayo iko na uzoefu wa muda mrefu sana kwa hivyo na sisi unajua kwamba mpangilio wetu pia umetutatiza kwa sababu ya covid-19 ni jambo linasikitisha sana kwa sababu ukiangalia mara ya mwisho wachezaji wa huko nyumbani wamecheza kabumbu ilikuwa ni mwezi wa tatu sasa tunakaribia kumaliza mwaka uh, shirikisho limetoa fixtures hawajui itakuwa vipi protocol za covid hatujui tutafanya nini kwa hivyo inachangia mali pakubwa kwa sababu wachezaji ambao tumewaingiza wa huko nyumbani imekuwa ni vigumu sana wao kwa sababu hawana mazoezi ya kutosha hawana competition kwa hivyo inakuwa ni tatizo ndio kwa sababu unaona kwamba ni kama mchanganyiko maalum ukiwa na timu ya taifa of course we wanted to win but we are halfway there sunday you must make us proud and we will all be watching some of us might come along with you to Komoro. And on behalf of the government of Kenya and all of us, I want to tell you, we are very proud of the game. We are very proud of what, how you have played. We are very um, impressed with the coordination that we have seen. Um, Victor, you are just special and your team. Now, Finland spoiled Marcus Turam's 
party on Wednesday after beating France 2-0 on the day the attacker emulated his father Lilian Turam by making his debut for Le Bleu. Turam was picked for the friendly over 22 years after his dad won the World Cup at the same ground. Marcus Force and only Valakari scored for the visitors. Elsewhere, Cristiano Ronaldo continued his quest to snatch the all-time record for most international goals when he struck his 102nd Portugal goal in their 7-0 uh, win over Andorra. Meanwhile, Italy extended their unbeaten streak to 20 games after a second string lineup comfortably beat Estonia 4-0. In other results, Netherlands beat Spain 1. I mean, Netherlands and Spain drew 1-1. Germany beat Czech Republic 1-0 as Belgium emerged 2-1 winners over Switzerland. For the senior side, for Paulinho. Substitutes. Ronaldo takes it in his stride, threads it through. Who's going to get the goal? It will be Renato Sanchez. Paulinho gives it to Trincao. Trincao to Rui. Rui's cross, Palinho! What a superb goal that was. Silva continues the movement. Wants to get it onto that magic wand of a left foot. It takes a double deflection. And Silva looks almost embarrassed to celebrate the goal. He just did it. They're creaking here, Andorra. Ronaldo! Yes, she gets it! He won't be a Portuguese international night. Down hello to Silva. Silva hangs it in the air. Comes to Jao Felix! It's seven. It's a confidence building performance this from Portugal. Confidence. Now, Argentine football legend Diego Maradona left hospital on Wednesday, eight days after undergoing surgery to remove a blood clot on his brain. Maradona left the clinic in Buenos Aires by ambulance shortly after his doctor told reporters he could go home. The doctor had earlier published on Instagram a photo of himself hugging the 60-year-old who wore a bandage on his head. Maradona is expected to continue his rehabilitation in Tigre, that is 30 kilometers north of Buenos Aires. The World Cup winning former Argentine captain underwent surgery last Tuesday to remove a clot lodged between his brain and skull. Alongside Brazil's Pele, who turned 80 last month, Maradona is widely regarded as one of the greatest football players of all time. Now, Formula One is returning to the Turkish Grand Prix on Sunday since 2011, with 16 drivers making their debut there. Valtteri Bottas, Charles Leclerc, Max Verstappen among the 15 racers uh, who will be racing for the first time in Istanbul. Others include Alexander Albon, Carlos Sainz, and Pierre Gasly, Lewis Hamilton, Sebastian <coughs> Vettel, Sergio Perez, Kimi Raikkonen, and Nico Halkenberg, previously raced at the tacky leg of Formula One. Lewis Hamilton holds record for most race 